All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to give a couple minutes till a few people get on here and uh, start viewing. Um, and then we'll get going from there. So. Not normal. Can you see how many people are live? I can. There's six people viewing right now. I can't even see that. That's kind of Maybe. Yeah. I'll open yeah. it on the Facebook. Oh, that's weird. Well, but then you'll it'll reverb through the mic on your phone. So you need to remember to mute your phone if you're going to do that. Yeah, I got it sorted. Live okay. expert. Yeah. Good, good job. <laughs> um, let's see here. Yeah, I get to see how long we've been on too. So. I can see that. Uh, hey, Chris, how's it going, buddy? Oh yeah. My wife's being silly. Adam. All right. Well, we've got about 50 people on, um, so we'll go ahead and get started, uh, let people trickle in. Um, today, we are building bag D, or the infamous D bag for the 8X Elite bag. Kit. Um, I've got on here with me Andrew Ford from Australia. Um, hey. He works out of the office out of that side of the world. Um, Andrew, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you, your family, what you do for a hobby, that kind of thing. Yeah, so thanks for having me on. Um, my name is Andrew Ford, live in Australia, um, live in a place called Adelaide, which is in the south, so right at the bottom of Australia. Um, reasonably small population, like 23 million people. Um, oh. And the, the actual, that's pretty much concentrated into one area, so a lot of uh, nothing in the outback. <laughs> um, lots of nothing. Australia has lots of nothing. Small cities and then lots of just outback. Um, been racing for 15 years. Uh, run mostly eight scale throughout those 15 years. Um, bit of 10 scale off road, but mostly buggy, truggy. That's about it. Awesome. Okay. Oh, where, where I work. Huh? Oh, where I work. You said about where you work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah work for a import over here called O'Reilly Model Products. And we do, among other brands, TLR, Spectrum, it's all the Horizon stuff. Uh, so yeah, that's what I do for a day job. And then uh, race on the weekends for fun. Yeah, so, sounds like me. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, my name's Ryan Dunford. For those of you that don't know me, I figure most of you that are on here probably actually know me personally, if not through here. Um, I work for Horizon. I help to make the eight scale products for us for uh, the TLR race side. Um, we're going to build bag B. So you saw me go ahead and open that up. And I opened the plastic bag. So that's what's right here. Um, you can kind of see this wire through here. That's my phone stand. We're going to try to use an overhead today because the poor people watching the other, I kept moving my computer screen so that you could sort of look down. Um, but uh, the technology sorted now. Yeah. We, well, I tried it this way the first time I did one of these Facebook lives and I used my phone. My phone's pretty old. Um, I stole my wife's phone Nokia this time. 3310? Uh, I, I stole my wife's phone this time, so it should be better. Treat yourself. Get yourself a new rag and a nice phone. Um, so, guys, um, the 8X Elite uh, Bag D, uh, some of the updated parts, um, I'll go ahead and open this bag too. This is the rest of the plastics, more or less, um, so you guys can see. But what you get with the 8X Elite updated parts, whichever way, that really is weird. Um, you get the updated arms. Guys, on this arm now, where you see this like this, that's meant to stay there. You don't cut that off. So I've seen a couple people do that. Don't do that. Um, the arm, the spindle carriers come packaged like this now. Okay. Pull on that side, you get this big block here. That big block, all it does 
push right out of there. Okay. This is what they put in after they mold it to keep this spread apart properly so that your steering is nice and free now. So these two blocks, these are trash. Unless you just want two big old blocks of plastic. Um, in the Elite Kit, you now get both the carbon and the plastic arm inserts. Um, so these are updated. You get uh, universals in the front instead of CBAs. You get the new black tower, which we'll get to. Um, and for the 8X, it's, the, it's got the camera holes the same as the 8XE. Um, yeah, those are most of the updated parts. So I'm going to go ahead and get started building here. Um, this bag built, bag D builds bag by bag. So I've got bag D1, D2, D3, and D4. So I'm going to put everything else aside. I'm going to start with bag D1. Nope, I don't know how to do this. Yep, there you go. Bag D1. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> we'll get this sorted. Is that your first time on a stream? or? You know what, buddy? Um, so, Andrew, what, uh, what have you been racing lately? I mean, I know you told me some story about kind of getting stuck somewhere recently. Uh, so tell us about your last eight-scale race. Uh, the last eight-scale race was the national titles, actually, which is in Melbourne. Which is eight hour eight hour drive from Adelaide. It's the next closest city. So what's that like uh, seven hundred and thirty kilometers, whatever that works out to in miles. You can do the conversion. Kilometers, aren't you cute? Yeah, you know the metric system that makes sense. I noticed you changed to cars to metric, so <laughs> <laughs> it must have made enough sense to do that. Um, but yeah, when we were over there racing, the uh, regulations here were like changing day by day. So we we left and everything was uh, kind of okay. And then every single day there'd be like an update from our prime minister. So we ended up having to shorten the four day race meet into three days, um, run our finals on Saturday. And then yeah. on Saturday night, our state um, announced they were closing their borders. So we were in a different day. And they said you had to be across the border by like, I think they said 8 p.m. Sunday, which would be fine. So we left, got home, um, and then figured out that I couldn't work for two weeks because if you crossed the state border, you had to go into two weeks of quarantine. Perfect. So, okay. yeah, I went away racing and then got, got an extra two weeks at home <laughs> doing nothing. Okay. Well, guys, I'm uh, starting to put the pinion uh, for your ring and pinion in. So I typically press the front bearing in place and then I'll put the bigger bearing, the five by 13 and the bearing spacer on and I'll feed that in from the backside and just push that in nice and solid. Come in here, set that down. So motor spray, anytime you have metal, like a screw or an, uh, in this case, a set screw, it comes with machining oil on it. So you always just want to just put a little bit of spray on your towel as you're building. Wipe those off. You can see it made a dark spot on my towel. That's just going to make it so that thread lock grips a little bit better. Um, I'm just using blue TLR lock. Um, I don't use any red thread lock on eighth scale. Uh, the only thing I use any red on is when I ran fifth scale for a little bit. Um, but usually on this part, we'll spray that set screw hole out a little bit too. Um, right. Wipe that off. Let it dry all the way. And then here's how I build this. So I hold it in from the back. I'm pressing on the pinion with my thumb with the flat spot up. Okay. I line up the set screw. I put thread lock in here. That kind of fills, not fills the hole, like as in fill a pool, but fills the top. I blow it in so you can see it goes all the way in there. I will take this and I rotate it around once. It seems weird, 
But more or less what that does is it puts thread lock almost like filler all the way around. So when it all dries, then I'm going to put a little thread lock on the set screw now because you can see most of the thread lock. It's gone from the hole. Now I'm going to put this in here. I didn't tighten it yet. I just want to wipe off the excess thread lock because I don't want it to get into this bearing here. Um, but now I'm going to go and get on it good. Not like I want to break anything, nothing like that. The thread lock's supposed to do the job of holding that on there. And what the thread lock does everywhere else is it, it kind of takes up some of the space that might exist in there for some vibration room. Um, wipe it off again real good. Do that. I have never had a single um, outdrive cup like this uh, fall off. I mean, I, never. Now, granted, I also do let this dry. So this isn't something I do and then I'm going to go right out on the track right now. This is something I do and then it's going to set for 15 or 20 minutes at least and dry. Um, but that's really the first step here. Um, you ever have any problems getting it off? Nope. And if I do, um, most of the time when I'm dealing with that cup, I keep this in my toolbox. It looks like a lighter. Gosh darn it. I will understand this one of these days. And it's, but it's actually a little micro torch. Okay. So instead of a lighter, I keep a little micro torch in my toolbox. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll torch that before I'll even try to loosen it. Then I'm not even dealing with any thread lock. So um, the other little hint is a lot of people don't know the two bearings that are in here now, the pinion bearings. We now make an HD pinion bearing set, which is two bearings for here and two bearings for the rear. It's TLR three, four, seven, zero, zero, zero. So you get four bearings and they're just really, really high quality, good ABEC bearings. Um, and I will literally run them for eight or 10 months at a time without single issue. And it just frees up my drive train even more. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and put the rear block on here. Um, I usually set my Hitachi to nine for this. It's not meant to really get in there and tighten it all the way. I'll do the final tightening and I'll just get one screw started. And then I'll go ahead and run this in as far as it'll go on nine. Right. And then I will double check with my 2.5. Again, these are just MIP wrenches, guys. Um, they do have the little Exotech things on here. It's easier for me to see that and they don't tear or anything as time goes on. And then I will make sure these are nice and snug. Um, and then I think that might be the first and second step. The next step is to put the front of our gearbox on. Now this, again, I will get one side started and then I will do the other side and it, I will actually push this that way as I'm putting the screw in. Um, and that just helps to keep everything lined up well because this is an angled boss. And I won't go in all the way, just snug. And then this, I'm going to push with this hand. I'm going to push this way, guys. And then I'll finish tightening it up. Now, this doesn't have to be super tight. You're literally just holding these two pieces together. These screws on the bottom will hold it together. Everything's pretty solid once it's all together. So if you wrench these down too far, this seam, because it's at an angle, will start to crush and move up. 
and your bearing boss won't be nice and smooth anymore. So any of you guys that notice that you have this and those aren't lined up, it's because you screwed the screw in too tight and you um, adjusted your bearing boss. Got a question here, Ryan. Okay. Um, Omar, he asked, can you do a video with the arm mod? Yep, that's on my list, Omar. Um, somebody gave me that. It might have been you, but I don't know. Somebody gave me that list yesterday or to add to my video list yesterday. Um, actually, no, I take that back. They wanted me to do the Camberlink mod in a video. Oh. Um, so I'll, I'll add that to the list. So we got Camber mod. Oh, you actually have a list. Well, I have it on another piece of paper, but I don't have that handy. So we're just going to write this down. Arm mod. Um, so now it's on the list. Um, right. So the next apparently step, Jose can't understand me, but I doubt that. I mean, it can be tough sometimes. Um, I need the front tower out of this bag. This is one of the things we're working on fixing is putting this tower into the main bag. Um, so you do have to open bag D4 to get this tower out of it. Um, All right. Sorry about that, guys. I'm making notes. Um, okay, so now, so that everything stays in place, the tower gets a set of screws inside the case here. So we're just going to put those in. Um, I did change the setting on my Hitachi to 5. So that you guys can see that. Okay. And the other thing I forgot to mention is before you start bag D, you need to grab your front camber links, obviously your front shocks, and your front diff. Okay? So the next step here is to actually put the front diff in the case. And I've had a lot of people have high spots in this diff, and I kind of talked about it the other day, but I just want to go over it again. Um, one of the only reasons to ever have a high spot in a ring gear is if when you're tightening these screws, basically, basically if you don't get this flat and level with this or on the same plane, right? So I've seen when guys tighten the first screw so tight and then they go to tighten the second screw and anytime you tighten one screw without something supporting the other side, it's always going to hold it being offset some. So you tighten to a certain extent, tighten to a certain extent, and you tighten a little bit more, tighten a little bit more, then you put the other two screws in, tighten, 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 okay? It's the best way to make sure that you're always gonna get this flat in parallel, this flat. But the other thing you do, so diff goes in here, right? You're always gonna push it in so that you're pushing the ring gear away from the pinion gear, right? So here's your pinion, here's your ring gear, pushing away from it as I'm pushing into the case. And I'm gonna go in and out a couple of times, push it far away from that as I can, okay? Now, you'll notice I didn't put any grease on the ring gear or the pinion gear yet. Um, it's in the manual at that step. <laughs> I don't put it on there because if I do, I manage, I always manage to get my fingers in it because I touch it through the bottom. So what I started doing is building the whole thing. And then at the end of bag D, I'll put the grease on through the bottom window here. So I didn't forget it. And yes, you want grease on your ring and pinion. Okay. Snap that in place. And you've got three different length screws here. Okay. Big, medium, and small. And they go from top to bottom. So this is the top, right? Big, medium, small. 
And the reason for that is to get the screw all the way back into the support. Now, again, my Hitachi's on five here. Run it in until it just stops. Run it in until it just stops. One of the easiest ways to tell if you put the screws in the right places, if you look here, you'll see the screw actually goes to nearly exactly flush with the plastic. So if you put the two screws that are too short here, it won't be long enough and you're not getting full engagement and you can rip the tower off the car. Not very fun. But yeah, again, like I said, you get the black tower here. Um, it's got the camber link holes like an 8XE. Um, and then the other thing I consistently see people do is drive all these screws in way too hard. And then things don't spin. Um, but we'll show you a trick for that too. So, and then I just go back and I double check that all my screws, they're seated all the way, but they're not like, I mean, they don't have to be cranked down this is sandwiching the tower in there so the screw itself doesn't require a lot of pressure to keep the shock tower in place okay there we go okay and you can see it's pretty good okay pretty good not as good as it could be here's what i do sometimes it's like that sometimes it's not um, if it's like that, most of the time, I'll, if you pull this cap off, put the cap on, you're fine. I take this, hold everything. Again, here's the ring gear. We want it to get away from the pinion gear a little bit. And then I just give it a couple good whacks. See? And that's good. Everything about that, that'll break in just fine. Um also, plastics tend to heat up and expand and contract over time. So, oh, that'll be good to go. Um, and that's bag D1. That's usually where they, that the end bag D1. Um, and again, I did not put grease on here because otherwise I get it all over myself. Um, just is what it is. Um, so how's everything been with uh, having all the updates on your car, Andrew, since you went to the to the elite car from your older car? Yeah, it's been good. I was running um, most of the bits on my 8X before the elite came out. Okay. And then just building the kit, you notice all these extra little bits that have had new touches and finishes to them and little minute changes just make the kit super nice. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm definitely not one to rest on my laurels, as they say. I, I if there's something I see that I think can be better, I'm gonna do it. Now it does mean that updates come, but I'd rather there be an update available so that when I wear out my old part, I can put a updated part on. Um, you know, so. I think one of the questions I got a lot about the original kit was that everything that's been updated, like, does it need to be changed? Is it weak? Does it break? My answer to that was no. Uh, if you had the original car, there were certain things you could do that were improvements. There was other things that, like the arms, for example, it wasn't like they broke or snapped off the car beforehand, but you improved them and made them better. So like you said, you don't rest and stop improving. If you can make a little improvement to a single part, you've gone and done that and it's improved the car overall. But if you had an original 8X, um, you you don't need to go out and buy every single updated part in the hope that every single bit improves the car because some of them are structural, some of them are slightly smoother. Yeah, I mean, when we're testing, we do try to have kind of all walks of life helping us test so that we have people that, some people are really good at breaking stuff uh, and just have an innate ability to do that. Um, so we always have those people on the test team, so to speak. Um, but whenever people find stuff and it's broken, I, I am that person. I'm like, please take a picture, send me a picture, give me the part, show me something. That way, if there's something we think we can do to make it better, we're going to do it. So, um, 
I'm going to get into what originally was probably one of the parts that people struggled the most to build, and that's the spindle kingpin setup. Um, so let me just give some information here. The first thing, these king pin screws, these were updated. The head's deeper, so for what it's worth, these did get updated in the Elite kit. You do get the Universal now instead of the CVA. You do get the V3 spindle. Um, first things first is I'm going to clean off the four screw, little tiny screws and the four kingpin screws here. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to use thread lock on them. So first things first, I do it before I start the step, not as I'm building so that they have a chance to dry. Because the last thing you want to do is get motor spray in with thread lock and then your thread locks no longer thread lock. Just so everybody understands that. Um, and it doesn't take a lot, but as you guys might notice here, this one spot I've been using that had motor spray on it continues to get more and more brown. <laughs> and that's just, that's manufacturing oil. Nothing too major going on. Um, so now all those screws are clean. So the other thing you're going to notice is I do build things a little differently. And I did put out a blog post on how I feel this should be built but it's your choice how to build them. So left, left, right, right. We'll always take those and put those separate. So I'm gonna build the right side first. And again, I'm gonna take the thread lock and it's gonna go into this hole. It doesn't go on the kingpin, it's gonna go into this hole. Because if I put it on the kingpin and then feed the kingpin through the bushing, most of my thread lock ends up in the bushing, between the bushing and the face. It ends up all over the place, and then you don't have a very good build. It's not free. So I fill this in. Again, not filling it in like a pool, but just so that it's flat to the surface. And then I give it a little blow. Yeah, I know. Right? And what that does is spread it out on the threads. And then I wipe off that surface. So now I've got no thread lock on this mating surface. Okay. I do the same thing here. Okay. You don't want to blow hard or you're going to blow it all out of there. Wipe off that surface. Set that down. I'm going to do the left side too. On here. Okay, and I'm gonna wipe that off and set that down. Again, you saw that I set it this way so that the thread lock stays in place. So here's my right one, thick spacer. So you've got a thick and a thin hat spacer or spindle shim, two millimeters, one millimeter. Now you can put, you, you can only ever put one one millimeter and one two millimeter in. So your spindles are either up or down. We build them with the spindles down. Okay. And this goes in here. The RH is facing up. And since everything else is already clean, whoop, I can apparently miss. I haven't done that in a while. All right, so now, as you could see, I put one side in a little bit and one side in. Now I will go in and I push one direction and I tighten the first one. I push back that same direction and I come in and I tighten the second one. Now, you can see, maybe, if I can get this right. See how there's thread lock in there? I go in and I wipe that off because I and I want it out of there. So that's all the thread lock that would have been between your spindle shims through your spindle and would make it a pain to rebuild this in the future, right? So now it's all clean. You can see there's no thread lock in the bearing boss. I, you can't really see that, but you can still look nice, smooth, right? 
So now, again, same thing on the other side. Marking to the top. Had you ever put any grease on those shims? Nope. When you run it in the aluminium one, do you? Nope. You can. I've seen people do it. Um, There's a, like a recess in the middle of it, isn't it? Uh, sort of. That's not, that's a, a machining recess. It's not really for grease. Um, it was never meant to be greased, but there's no reason. I mean, you are turning. Whoop. Okay, now there's a lot in that one. I went a little crazy, but before it goes everywhere. Right? If you have them get tight on you, they shouldn't be tight, guys. Whoop. There we go. Nice and loose. Let's go in here and clean this out. Now, the reason I did it that way, okay, you'll notice I didn't put the axle in first and everything. The reason I did it that way is because I've seen people do it. And they build it that way, but they build it with this in, and they put so much thread lock in the hole. When they tighten it, a bunch of thread lock ends up going down and into the either into the bearing boss, and then they struggle to get their bearing out in the future when they need to replace it, or it, the thread lock actually gets into the bearing itself, and then that's really bad because obviously it doesn't spin very well. So, um, yeah. So then I just kind of dropped this back bearing in here. Put the drive shaft in, put it on the front. Now guys, that pin should go in fairly freely. If it's not free, that means there's something wrong with the spacing. Um, the other thing to understand here is you're going to see I do put a tiny bit of thread lock on this set screw and it's mainly because there's sometimes when this pin isn't held in by a wheel as hexes get wider the pin might not be held in by the wheel with the pin being held in by the wheel I mean this set screw is really only for assembly like taking your wheel on and off not losing the pin but I've just gotten used to that so that I don't not do it <laughs> for the cars that actually need it. And then I use a pair of pliers for this, which most people would cringe. Um, a lot of people use a wheel wrench that has a hole in it, but mine doesn't because it's old. But the pliers that I use, if you look at them and the way that they're made, they're a special kind of plier and you can see that it actually grabs both flats. So when I get in here and tighten it and you don't have to grill all that on or anything, you can see, I don't have any marring or any, I didn't hurt anything, but it spins nice and free. Okay. If this pins tight to get in, this isn't going to spin freely and that's not good. That's not what you want guys. You can just use a wheel. Yep. You can use a wheel as well, but uh, that's way over there. Right, right. So, but yeah. Uh, for no, people that don't that. trust themselves with pliers, wheel's safe. That's true, yeah. Do you ever put any grease? Maybe that's every question I'm going to have is where do you put grease? Do you ever put any grease over, like when you put the drive shaft through, the both, through both bearings and then you've got the section that you slide the wheel hex over, do you ever put any grease on the drive shaft there? I've found sometimes if you wash your car with like simple green or you run water, that you, if, you, if you have a little thin bit of lithium grease there, that wheel hex always slides off, but can get rusted on. So, um, Andrew races in places that sometimes they continue to race when there's rain coming down often. Uh, cause sometimes they don't have as much, yeah, this is really big in Europe. 
So in Europe, you lightly grease that entire shaft, um, your, your axle, um, because they run in a lot of water. If you are a person that cleans off your car and you use just simple green and you forget to go back and spray it off with like a WD or something to get some lubrication back in there, you can get to, to Andrew's point, you can get enough rust buildup in here that it's like really difficult to get the wheel hex off. Um, but I have never been in the habit of spraying my car off completely with anything and, and washing it. If I want something to be clean, I pull my car apart and I clean it piece by piece personally. Um, anytime I'm racing so that my car stays as consistent as possible, I do not spray it down. They, the one thing I see a lot of people do that are learning is they'll see pros like spray their car down at the end of the day to clean it off before they pack it up, make sure it's lubricated. They think, oh, that's what I should do every time I run it because it's going to be really pretty and clean when I run it. The problem with that is you don't know where either simple green is getting that you're not getting some type of like a grease or a lubricant back into. Um, and it can completely change your car. You could get WD-40 in one hinge pin and simple green in the other hinge pin. And now one works well and one doesn't. Um so personally, I stay away from that kind of stuff unless there's a lot of water involved. And then my car gets sprayed down with WD-40 and right before I set it out to try to keep as much mud off of it as possible. <laughs> it works for two laps. Right. Or some of these new ones, like you yeah. mentioned, like Maxima and some of these other greases, they actually work pretty good. Bio wash. What is that? But it's uh, something they have here. Maxima is a U.S. company, so. Um, I've used the SC1. That stuff's wicked. That stuff's pretty good, yeah. Smells um, good. Um, Probably smells dangerous, delicious. but it smells good. Um, so let me go ahead. I'm going to put the arms on now. Again, I'm putting Threadlock in the holes. Now, this one, I actually get a little bit of Threadlock kind of everywhere. Almost to act as an, as an adhesive. And we're going to put one screw partly in and the other screw partly in. Okay. Now the one thing I will say about these screws is they are 1.5s. They're small screws, but you can see all the thread lock that came out the bottom before it gets everywhere. I didn't tighten yet. I just got them snug. Okay. So now I essentially have thread lock between and I have thread lock in all the screws. I have thread lock here, a little bit of it everywhere, kind of glues it all together. I've never had these screws come loose on me either. Um, but now when you go to tighten it, you don't want to, you don't want to just put your force this way. You want to push in and put the force on the screw. So push in, put the force on the screw, remembering that it's a smaller tip screw, push in, put the force on the screw. Okay, and then we'll wipe everything off again. So it's pretty. This is Jim's car, so it should be pretty. He makes pretty stickers, so it's only fair. Um, and then I'll do the other side here. What about you, Andrew? Any tips or tricks for building all this stuff? Anything you found that works well for you? From what you've done, the only difference uh, I do is those spindle shims. I use a lithium grease, like a, a thin layer of lithium grease on the outside. Um, okay. I run the aluminium um, caster block though, so uh, I do that and uh, I build the oh, aluminium. Acumen. Yeah, aluminium. What do you call it? Come on, you know how to speak American. I do. Um, well, we talk about American talking in a sec because I got one issue with it. Uh, which you can explain hopefully. Um, <laughs> but the the Ackerman plate or the spindle plate that you're building now, uh, I do the same as you. I almost treat it like when I build that onto the spindle, it doesn't come off. It's going to be um, there forever. Yeah, lock, it Loctite's on because if you ever have one of those one and a half mil screws back off slightly, 
um, and you have a big crash, it'll snap the head off the other one because there's one screw holding it on. So you right. yeah, do what you did. It actually works really well. Okay. So before you get started, question for you. Why is okay. soldering called soldering? Oh, well, you pronounce it. So here's what I'm going to tell you about Americans. Um, <laughs> okay, get a lesson there. At one point in life, we used to be hard workers. These days, I've found a lot of Americans have gotten lazy in a lot of ways. Pronunciation of some things is one of those. So pronouncing the L in there, that's just extra work, dude. It's soldering. So, yeah, okay. So it's not a, like a pronunciation thing. It's just like, it doesn't make any sense. Solder? Do you call it solder? Solder. Like the stuff is solder? Like, uh... But you write it with an L, right? S. Well, yeah, we write it S O L D E R, like it's spelled. Oh, right. We Correctly. Pronounce yeah. it like S A W D E R. So Daughter. I oh, never got that. I worked in electronics for years, and I just never, I never got it. I was like, what is this? Soldering. Must be something I'm missing. Right. All right. So now we're on to bag D three. So two more bags to go. And it starts to actually look like a front end here soon. Because right now it doesn't. It just looks like a gearbox. And I always, I don't know why, I've always kind of sorted all my screws out to begin with. Um Again, it's it's just for me to make sure that everything's really there before I start building. So there's all that. So the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of prepare the arms. So that's getting the inserts in, which is a whole bunch of screws. Hi, right. you can go ahead. Here, watch. I'll cover that up for you. Sorry guys, one of my roommates got home, so it's part of life. Um, Do you have roommates? Huh? Do you have roommates or was that your wife? That was my roommate, one of my roommates. Uh, it's expensive to live in California, dude. Yeah, right. And so, Was that your backyard though that you were cutting up? Yeah. And I only have that because I live in Riverside. Do your roommates are cool with you doing the track out the back? Uh, I'm working on it. Someday it might be one. I really was doing it to level it off. But it turns out that half of it was too muddy to do it right. Right. Um, so it is what it is. But just so you guys know, the front arms, you can run it without this insert. The arm's strong enough to run without an insert. You can run it with the plastic insert, which is the next stiffer, and you can run it with the carbon insert, which is the stiffest. Um, some people go so far as to glue the inserts into the arms. Um, I've done it with the plastic inserts and it seems to make a difference. I haven't found that it makes a big difference with the carbon insert for me. And then I was also raised on a budget and I'm still on a budget today, so if I do break an arm, then I can't reuse my carbon insert if it's glued in there. <laughs> so, um, are there no aluminum rear hubs for the Elite? There are aluminum rear hubs. It doesn't come with them, Chris. So, yeah, if you see any questions as we're going along here, Andrew, because this part's kind of boring. I'm literally just putting in a bunch of screws. So, that was on one on my Hitachi, guys. One. Don't strip out screws. Um, this one I'm going to turn Aluminum. Out. Aluminum. Aluminium. Aluminium. We actually write it differently. Really? No, you don't. I don't know. We say it differently. <laughs> you do say it different. Okay. And these droop screws, I always suck it up from the top. And then for me... I run it in and out a few times while it's warm. And that basically just almost creates permanent threads in the plastic. 
So that's one arm that's ready, it's prepared. Chris, yeah, the aluminium rear hub is the same for the Elite and the X. So if you have them on the X, they'll fit the Elite. So what's it like racing? What kind of tracks do you guys usually race on out there? Um, actually, in the last probably year, year and a half, a lot of the tracks have gone to like a sort of a almost a treated surface, like medium grip, really smooth. Um, actually, our, our home tracks like medium grip, almost no tire wear. You can run S4 for three club meets. Um, wow. It's quite smooth. <laughs> um, it's actually awesome. So, But they're quite different to like when I went to the States. Our tracks are, are nothing like that as far as surface is concerned. So the setups kind of tend to differ a little bit. A little bit? Yeah, a little bit. Just just a smidgen, right? Yeah, it's totally. Like I pretty much run slide lock. Like at home, slide lock's the only tire I run. Yes, you and Kyle McBride. They're the best tire, I, I Although, swear. I can't say anything because I really like the slide lock. I think it's a pretty good tire. It's a great practice day tire, even regardless, just because it lasts forever. And yeah. It gives pretty good traction. Now, guys, suspension should be free. Okay. When you build a car, it should be free. If it's not, something's wrong. Something needs to be either adjusted or something, but everything should drop under its own weight when you're building. Okay. Vinny's asked, uh, what sway bar works best? Well, it depends who you are. Um, I've started running thicker front sway bars on my 8Xs. Um, I'm up to a 2.6. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, I, I run that thick of a sway bar because I found that the car, a lot of people were always like, well, the rear end does this this squatty thing. And it it never really came from the rear end. It always came from the front end. And as I put a stiffer front sway bar on, that feeling of the rear end getting squirmy went away completely. So it, the sway bar was one of the things I found that really helped to balance the front rear end of the car. Um, so like the 8X Elite, it comes with a 2.4 now, but in the option parts, you get a sway bar that was never even available before with the 8X. So you get up to a 2.6 front sway bar now. Um, so you get two up and two down in the 8x elite so you get 2.23 four is what's in the bag to build with and then you get five and six so 2.5 2.6 and um i really like the 2.6 sway bar so I, I can't say anything bad about it for me and i've even got pro guys running it now i run the 2.6 as well yeah it just it just balance, it helps to balance the car. That's really what it's about. But you guys can see here, I'm putting all my sway bars on, my sway bars, my hinge pins in. Um, didn't get to the sway bar yet, but that's what no, we're talking about. But, um, now, some people run aluminum nuts everywhere, which are fine. They, they work fine. Um, the one place I'd recommend always running steel nuts or this back nut and this front nut for your shocks. Um, the rest of the places you can run aluminum nuts, but most aluminum nuts out there that I have found, the engagement with the thread locking feature isn't as good. So I'll always thread lock aluminum locking nuts in place in eight scale. So. It's up to you. You can do it if you want, but you can see I tighten that completely. This is still nice and free, guys. That's how it should be. Um, some of the stuff that we've worked on for sure. And then, whoops, sorry. Don't break the camera. Right, here, watch this. People will get a kick out of this. Let me do this one real quick. So if I go out here, yeah, this is my camera mount. This black thing, my camera's up here above my head, just so you guys can see okay. Um, but yeah, no, we don't need to see that. Um, no, it's very nice, Ryan. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and put 
camber links on, okay? Camber links we built earlier. You can see that when I put the lines, let's do it up here. When the lines are together, one's got a flange and one's got this. The reason for that is when you build the car, you build it such that both the lines are on the same side. In our case, in the TLR manuals, you'll see that that line is always on the United States driver's side. <laughs> Because driving in Australia, we drive on the other side, which was a fun experience. Um, right. Or the left side of the car, which is commonly, we, we usually call the side of the car from the back of the car. So if you're looking from the wing to the front, the left side of the car is this side. Just think so, of the car as if you're driving it. Yes, exactly. From whatever side you feel comfortable driving it from. The well, correct in, in side our or case, the in our case, we're driving in the middle, right? Because we've got a single cab. I uh, struggled so badly driving in the U.S. Yeah, well, I know the feeling. It's difficult. All right. So now the manual calls for these being in the number four hole. I kind of just get them started on the inside here. The number four hole is on the inside, the fourth hole up from the bottom. We always count from the bottom. It's just what we've always done. And then I Are you running in. the fourth hole in your car? Uh, yes, I am running the fourth hole in my car right now. I go back and forth between the fourth and the fifth hole. Um, and then we put this end in. Now, some people, you can just get here and press on that all day long. I take my pliers with them open, right? And grab the very edge of the both flats of this ball here. And I literally just push it right in. Now, I'm building this car for Jim. The manual calls for it to be built out in this B hole or the outside hole. I'm going to build it to the A hole, um, which is the inside hole. Stop laughing, sweetie. Um, because most people find that it's easier to drive that way. And I love Jim. He's great at stickers. And we're just going to leave it at that. So... People should play around with those two two positions. Yeah, it's it's different. If you run a longer link, it can cause the car, make the car feel a little bit more stable sometimes, um, which isn't a bad thing. It just depends what type of track surface you're on, right? So now I go in and I get all four of these nuts started on the back at the same time. I tighten the inners and then grab my 2.0 and tighten the outers. Now, again, guys, these don't need to be gorilla in place. I mean, these are literally, they're just holding it. There's a lot of support between these two. I'm not mashing it on. It doesn't do anything for you. Just go until it's taut and you're done, right? So now I will go in here and get my wrench you can see both my lines are on what is the left hand side and they're not too bad but they're actually not too bad i didn't measure them these two i never measure it's the steering links that i always measure the steering links again need to be exactly the same and we'll talk about that when we get to that part of the build i already opened this because this is where we had packaged the shock tower um, and the front, the A block, um, trying to fix that in future kits. Sorry about that guys, but that's where you find it. It's there. You just gotta, just gotta hunt for it a little bit. Cut both of these open. So what do you have coming up race wise? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Well, well what is I don't know. One more race to get. Oh, we had. Two more national series rounds for eight scale, uh, ten scale state championships, which have just been passed. Oh, 
sorry, the date's just gone past. We're supposed to be in Western Australia, which I might have gone to. Um, national titles for electric. I don't know what racing we'll get to do for the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be one of those things, right? Yeah, no one knows. <clears throat> but, um, like, our tracks are still open. Well, I should only speak for the state that I live in, but the tracks are open, not for racing, but you can still go to the tracks and use them. So still able to practice, but can't hold race meets. Yeah, we're basically – some states allow us to um, – like kind of going for practice, but you can't have more than 10 people and you all have to be pitted six feet apart. Right. Yeah, we have like, you have to maintain your one and a half meters or however many feet that is. Uh, and there's no more than like 10 people. Like That's, that's only like five feet, dude. Why are you guys yeah. shorting yourself? What? what how, how far is your distance? Six feet. So, oh, you, okay. Anyway, you just like so, to play six foot. You don't get to say that much, do you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Five foot nothing. <laughs> I literally, I just put these on here, not tight at all yet, but they're in place with the sway bar. Then I'll put this on. Again, I do this with my Hitachi on one. Okay. I will put my screw in, and then I will look at this, and they're... Plenty tight enough. It's a little tiny screw. All it's doing is holding your sway bar in place, guys. Um, I always make sure I put the side that doesn't have the little kind of molding nub on it, the flashing. If there's flashing, I cut it off. Steve's oh, up. What advantage? What is the advantage of the unis in the front compared to CBAs? And what do you run on the rear? Well, you want you go ahead and go first. Uh, so in the front, uh, the unis are a little bit smoother, especially coming out the corner, especially through bumps. So they don't seem to have as much bind. So in the front, the unis make the car, I think, feel easier to drive. Um, probably on a smooth high bite track, it's not as noticeable. But if you're on a, um, a track with some bumps, and then coming out of the corner, the car is much more fluid, doesn't seem to catch um catch bumps and, and move the front end around so uni's a little bit easier to drive especially in rough tracks and the rear of the car uh in the elite kit it's the deep yoke cba so it's a cba um the actual uh joint portion of the cba is moved further into the hub so it's captured by the inner bearing um and this does a few things i'll let ryan kind of explain that but essentially you get less dog bone plunge down the out drive um you get less bind so you get more grip coming into the corner. Right. Um, and I've run both the DCVA these days and universals in the back. Um, it's something I'm playing with. And right now today I run universals in the back. Um, if the track's got smaller bumps, higher bite or medium bite or really high bite, then I run the DCVAs. So, um, so you guys will notice I put all this on. I started the longer set screws in the center, which adjust how tight this is. I did not tighten this right to left yet. Okay. So right now I'm going to start tightening one of these and just keep jiggling it around. And I'm going to go kind of slow. Okay. So you can see it stopped moving, right? Back that off. And I'm going to back off to about another eighth of a turn. And then I'm going to do the other side. So jiggling it all over the place. Okay. Back it off and back it off just a little bit more. So now, and so it still slides back and forth. There's barely any play in both the right and left side. And my sway bar is on there. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to center it or what I feel is centered. And I'm going to adjust this right side one first. And so the reason I usually do the right side one first is when you're tightening it, 
the tightening motion pulls the collar into this. So now they're on, they're both tight, still moves really well, it's centered, and we're good to go. So now I'm gonna build the portion that's in the back here. And I went through this in the last video. Uh, let me see what camera is better. Actually, we're gonna do it in this camera because I got okay at it. So see this, this link? This is the sway bar link. See that side? It looks like the plastic's the same plastic all the way around that hole, right? Same finish. If I turn this over, all of a sudden, you see this ring. See how it's shiny? I don't know if they can see anything. Oh, there you go. Okay. That's the side that was pulled off the mold. I always press all of my balls in through that side that was pulled off the mold because it's already a little bit more open than the other side and it keeps a freer setup, right? So that's in. See how it's nice and free. Okay, then I put the other one in again through the same side, shiny side. Same thing here. A few questions here. Kevin wants to know what drill that is. That's a Hitachi, I think, isn't it, Ryan? Yeah. Hitachi. D3DBL or something like that. Yeah. DB3DL. Uh, yep. There you go. Um, it when are we getting the new Truggy? <laughs> There's a question for you. All right, so I go in and I line up all these things. Okay. I don't have the set screws in there yet, but I'm going to go ahead and put these back screws in first. I will give my answer to the Truggy in just a second. I dodged it. Okay, and these, you go really, really slow, guys until you make sure that the screw is through the center hole. Because if you miss, you can bind up this link. And this link being bound up will bind up your whole suspension. Okay? But you can see we have no binding going on. Okay, now I'm going to go in with my 1.5 and put my set screws in. And I'm going to line up the back of the ball here with the wire. Okay, so let me show that to you. Okay, it would help if I didn't hit the mount first. Sorry about that. But you can see, I'm basically using my fingernail to push the ball back to the end of the wire so that everything's lined up well. Um, and you can see, I'm doing them at an angle. Okay. The reason you do them at an angle, see how I, I tighten them so that they're up at an angle? When you have the suspension go up, it clears the flats on the ball. So see how the angle of the ball matches the drive shaft now? Goes up, more clearance. You're usually never going to get it to go up that high, but I'd rather be safer than sorry. Okay, then we're going to put the upper mounts in. The kit location is three, so they, they fit into these slots, and then you use a four millimeter nut, a seven millimeter driver. And again, these ones, I will always keep these steel. I have tried aluminum, and I can't tell you how many times I've gone, and all of a sudden my shock mount's loose, and I've literally pulled the threads out of the aluminum nut. So for me, you will always see these nuts, both of these always being steel, right? So now I've got my shocks and we built those earlier. And you can see, maybe, there you are. We got our screws in, lines together. The, let's see here, is this one better? The screw and this screw are opposite. So I built my shocks correct. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the bottom right side in. And when I say right side, I'm talking about the side I'm looking down now. So if I'm looking at the front, 
I'm looking down. This is my right side right now. It's the left side of the car. I know that, but I'm looking down it. This is my right side. Gets the black screw. Okay. This left side gets the silver screw. This is right hand thread. This is left hand thread. And then when you turn the car around, it's the same way. The side you're looking at, the right is black, the left is silver. Now, the reason you want that is because we found if we use the same screw on both sides, on the left side, this screw would eventually come unscrewed. What else that means is these aren't going to come unscrewed. What that means is don't tighten these in there. You should almost be able to get your fingernail between the head of the screw and the arm. And the reason I say that is because when this is new, this slides in there pretty darn easy. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, what's wrong with your arms? After I built it, I couldn't get my shock in anymore. Well, it's probably because you tighten the screw a lot, okay? So you're gonna see, I'm gonna put this screw in now. Stop, sorry, I'm right-handed. Okay, I'm putting the screw in, I'm looking, oh, I'm good, okay. Look at that screw. I can get my fingernail in there, guys. That is perfectly fine. I'm never going to have that come loose. I'm also never going to have trouble getting my shock in and out of the arm. Because I didn't crush all the plastic together. And I put it on the outside hole. And I kind of go slow, make sure it's all lined up. And I go in and oh, I stop. I got a thumbnail in there. Now these go on. Okay, you can see these faces, the flat faces out for both of them. And the screw head is facing in. Okay, so whoop, there we are, just like that. You can see the screw head facing inside. The reason I always put that screw head inside is so that I don't get a bunch of dirt in it when I crash, because I crash plenty. I'm a very good tester that way. You're the crash test guy. I am one of the crash test guys. I We got one guy. He's super fast, but man, when he crashes, he does good. Who's that? Um, Anthony. He's very good at testing parts. All right. So this is your entire bag. You can see our sway bars working. Um, now, from the bottom here, if I can find it, I'm going to go in. And now I'm going to put grease in. Now I do it now. You can do it right before you put this onto the chassis. So you make sure you don't get grease everywhere. Um, but I found I tend to forget. And you don't have to glob this on or, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's by the time it gets around, the pinion and spur get around plenty. Or the pinion, the ring and pinion get around plenty and it's fine. Now, this car does come with the standard ring and pinion. Um, we obviously, uh, in a video I did the other day, we mentioned we do make an overdrive ring and pinion for the front now. And it is the ring and pinion that you have to change. Um, but yeah, front end of an 8X, no problem. And this is what I do with all my bags. As I'm building, I always put them in the big bag they all started with. And the reason I do that is... In the past, I've thought I've gotten everything out and there'll be like a little itty bitty set screw or an E-clip or something in there. And if I throw it in the big trash can, I have to dig through the big trash. If I put them all together in here, I can easily find the little bag and get it out of there and it's no problem. Tyler asked you about the, had a question about the sway bars with the angle. He said off topic, but would you do that with the 10 scale too? Would you usually uh, how I line it up in the back? Yes, I think that will possibly be the, the lining of the bar. Yeah, as far as how it lines up on the bar, um, you don't usually have to. It, it all depends where everything sits, front to rear. I don't have my ten scale here. I would my twenty two four is in the garage. Um, I found I didn't need to do that with the twenty two four. The ball was able to sit far enough back. We've got a lot of stuff that's bigger than 10 scale and it makes it jam together up front. 
and that's why we hit put the flats on the sway bars. Um, let's go back. Let me scroll through some of these. Uh, let's see. Um, I do want to talk about, oh, wait, here we go. There's one guy, Steve. Cool. I was just curious if you mix and match between front and rear. I've kind of found that on other brands last lap. I'm assuming he's talking about drive shafts still. Yeah. Um, yeah. His question was about the uni in the front and what do you run in the rear? So some things I want to mention about drive shafts, guys. Um, one, drive shafts take a long time to break in. Okay. When they're new, I typically Dremel just scuff up the pin face all the way around. Um, the other thing is once they're broken in on a side, that's the side they live on forever. So once this drive shaft is on this right side, it's a right side forever. If I bend this drive shaft, I replace both my right and left. And that's because they break in differently as pairs. If I take this set and I want to try unis in the back, I take this as a set and this goes as a right and a left in the rear. So whenever I pull a drive shaft out, if I'm keeping it for testing or something else, I mark it right, left, and I usually rubber band or zip tie them together as a set. Um, the reason for that is just so I can make sure when I go to put them in another end or use them in another car that I can make sure that, you know, everything's going to go in and work properly. So um, I will tell you that if you are going to try the dog bones in the rear, you want the most done set of bones you can find. So I usually recommend to people, if you want to try them in the rear, pull the ones you've been running out of the front and put those in the back and put new ones in the front. Don't put new ones in the rear. Um, they literally will take you two bottles of fuel to break in. It's one of the things we learned during Nitro Challenge. Um, Is that two four liter bottles or a gallon? That's two fuel bottles. So two four liter bottles. 3.8. 3.8, whatever. Nah. Fuel bottles, whatever you use to fuel your car. Um, okay, so let me answer the Truggy question. I don't need to show it on here. So the Truggy, um, you guys saw it run at DNC. Um, those were actually all T1 cars. <laughs> Literally the first parts we ever got for it. Um, and while it ran really well, it ran well for all of us that ran it. Um, it's actually a lot better now. I've had some time to work with it some. Um, as we've been making parts and making them fit right and stuff. So I know you guys think, oh, you ran it. It's all good. Well, we ran it. We drilled stuff out. We dremeled stuff. I mean, you fit it together as best you can when you're running something like that. Um, Right now, the only reason I can say this is because Todd actually let it out of the bag on a previous uh, one of these, but the Truggy release is expected mid-summer time for what it's worth. So that could be one of three or four months, depending on where you live or what's going on. I can't get more specific than that. Um, we are working on it. Considering the question was from someone who lives in Australia, could you specify the month? That you mean when you say summer or well, the months because here we're summer and christmas i can't even hear anymore did you mute me i can't hear you Got it. Yeah. So whatever you just said then, couldn't hear a thing. Oops. My bad. So, yeah, I, I remember that now. Sorry about that, guys. Um, if I take my this camera out, this is my audio. So I removed it so it could just be you and me, but then it messed everything up. So. All right. There's going to be three of us. Yeah. You, me, you, me, and the towel. You, um, me, and the dirty rag. <laughs> right? Um. What were you saying? Months of relief? When's summer? 
we would summer for us. I mean, I'm in California. Summer for me is through like November, dude. Yeah, right. How's that for an answer? Yeah, well, <laughs> not very descriptive. I like it. Polit yeah. Political answer. Right. It's not going to be November. Don't worry about it. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, you guys literally saw the first three of those in existence at DNC. And you never saw a DNF. You never saw a single part break. You never saw anything. And that's because none of that ever happened, uh, which is a good sign for a T1 car. Um, so now it's just fit and finish stuff. We actually changed the drive shafts in them. <laughs> Strangely enough, um, and the car's even better. Like, man, if I had the truck that I had today for Nitro Challenge, if Dakota had it, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have even been funny. Um, Did you have one with that truck? Is it that good? My class? I, <laughs> I would have been up there. I'd have, I'd have at least, well, with the truck that I had at Nitro Challenge, if I would have gotten a start, I would have been up there. But I right. was... 12th off the start 10 seconds back from 11th because everybody piled up before that big jump over three cars piled up and filled the entire lane and i didn't know what to do i'm like well i could go around them but then technically that's me cutting the track because i would have to go around them and around that big hump because they were mm. all right on the front of it the face of it i'm like that doesn't seem right and i'm like do i pull the days of thunder thing and just full throttle and see how this goes yeah or do i wait and i went with option b and it didn't work out for me I, it worked out for me about as well as it did in days of thunder right you smashed into um, a out. i went to my truck uh i wouldn't say it went to the hospital but it just got set to the side for a little bit while they got everybody else and then i got to go but right. um i mean i worked my way up to a top five so for the first outing with the truck with that group of people the 40 plus class is no joke these days. I mean, it literally is past world champions and national champions and all kinds of interesting folks. So, and you, well, and me, <laughs> and some old dude. Um, are you 40? I am 43. I will be 44 this year. Jeez, I feel bad now. I've been doing this since I was seven, so I've got about 36 years wrenching on RC cars. Um, I've got more gray hair than you. Wow. I mean, they do make hair dye, but I'd watch out because people keep swapping bottles in those things. So you never know what color you're going to end up. No, it's distinguished for now. I'll keep telling myself that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, but I don't really see any more questions. Um, I know it is just a build, guys, so we don't want to take this longer than it really needs to be. Thank you, guys, those of you that watched. Um, if you're some of the TLR guys, please be sure to share this after it's put up. Um, that way people know it's out there and exists. Um, this does get posted to both Facebook, the TLR page, and to YouTube, the Team Lucy Racing page. Um, so you can use either of those links. Um, I will make a playlist once all of these bags are done. Um, so you can help your friends out if they're building a new car. You can just send them the link and then they can watch as they build. And I guarantee we've talked long enough for even a newbie to build bag D. <laughs> so uh, I, the reality is bag D usually takes me 20 minutes, maybe 25, uh, especially when you have a drill. I mean, I can't talk about a drill enough, guys. Um, there's another one that I've been using at the office that it's yellow. I think it's DeWalt. And you actually... It's a gyroscopic drill, and you turn it to t screw in and out. It's really weird to get used to, but as far as power goes, it's way more powerful. It's got more torque than this one. This one doesn't have the most torque in the world. Like, if I'm trying to put the screws into the bottom of the um, center diff mounts, which is like glass, like strong glass material, I can't get them halfway in with this thing, even on four like Put it on low range. Mine does it. You must have got a dodgy one. This is a dodgy one. I will give you that. So this one, five is like six, and the clutch half works. And this was a my really good one. I had an original one, and it got stolen with all my stuff about three or four years ago. So, um, 
But guys, just like I always say, if you've got other ideas for videos you want to see, if there's somebody else you want to see on here instead of Andrew in the future, um, you know, just not. let me know. Um, but uh, I really appreciate Andrew for you coming on here. I know it probably gets kind of boring on that side because I have to talk through some of it. Um, but thank you for telling us a little bit about where you're from and what you do there. And uh, uh, I appreciate it, but I'm going to end this broadcast for everybody else out there. And thank you guys. And I appreciate it. Take it easy.